We kneel down and I'm holding my hands together and uh, ready to pray. And all of a sudden his hand creeps into my hand and he like wedges my hand away and he takes my hand into his and he's like rubbing his thumb all over my hand. And then he starts like starting to just like press the rest of his body, the profile of his body up against mine, elbows, arms, hip, thigh, knee, leg. In my head, I'm fight or flight. In my body, I'm frozen. And then all of a sudden he nuzzles himself. Ugh, he like nuzzles himself into my head and neck. And he whispers, it's your turn. The Institute in Basic Life Principles was a worldwide fundamental Christian organization run by a manipulative narcissistic leader named Bill Gothard. It was one of the largest cults in America and it was hidden in plain sight with very few people outside of the cult actually knowing about its existence. But that all changed when IBLP and Gothard were finally exposed with the release of Prime Video's number one documentary series, Shiny Happy People, which focused on the cult's first family, the Duggars. Tonight, we have a very special guest, one of the women featured on the Shiny Happy People documentary to share more about her experience. Lindsay Williams, welcome to the show. How are Hi, you? Hi, I'm so good. Thanks for having me. This is, Absolutely. I'm so excited to talk to two of their ex ATI guys. Oh, we're all ex cult members here. And, and <laughs> speaking of which, we've also got my good friend and former cult member Bryce. Bryce, thank you for joining us again. Glad to be here. And I just want to put allegedly in front of narcissists that he's not been diagnosed. So allegedly. Fair point. I'm going to go with absolutely is uh, just based on, <laughs> on my observations. <laughs> so, Lindsay, uh, obviously you were a huge part of the Shiny Happy People documentary and, you know, talked all about your experience with Bill Gothard. Um, but it seemed like the documentary focused a lot more on the Duggar family. Uh, mm -hmm. which, which is totally understandable. But for me, and I think for a lot of people, it, it left us wanting to hear more about what you went through. Um, sure. You were very close with Bill Gothard, um, one of his inner circle, if you will. And, and so I just wanted to hear from you what that experience was like. Um, it was pretty trippy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it, it really started out with um, almost a fascination with with him, um, especially because of the way that we're raised. I had been in the program for for 10 years in the homeschooling program. My parents had been in IBLP uh, circles maybe two or three years prior to that and then were aware of the homeschooling program starting in 84. And then in 86, my parents got in and enrolled us. So I was very, very steeped in this like just idolization of Bill Gothard mm. from a really young age. Um, even though I didn't like what I was not learning at home, I didn't like what the wisdom booklets had to bring for me. Um, and I definitely struggled my entire upbringing as to my belief in God. Um, I just, I cried out to him constantly and tried to do all the right things, but I never saw any change in the abuse at home or in the direction of things. I always felt very lost and very just like an item that would be traded at some point, like a trading card or, you know, a, a fun filly that was traded off to be a broodmare. You know, yeah. it was just, I just felt like property and a piece of something, but had such a fire inside of me to be more than that, um, but was never allowed to. Didn't matter what I did. I just, I, I would always fill my space quickly and then not be allowed to go any further. So it was very depressing at home, but I always felt very energized and charged that someday I would find the right thing. Like God would give me something. And I got involved in children's institutes, which was, um, these fun breakout sessions for children while their parents are in the big sessions, learning all the Gothard's materials in the basic and advanced seminar. And I'd done several of them in a few different cities. And when I was in Atlanta for one of these children's seminars, he, I did not know this. I don't think any of the students knew that he was staying at the same hotel as the rest of us. Hmm. And uh, so we go down on Tuesday morning and in walks Bill Gothard. I mean, the Mr. Gothard right. full on in the navy blue suit and his red tie. And he comes waddling in because he has like a weird kind of like he kind of wobbles back and forth when he walks. And um, he's got, you know, sort of like greased over hair. And it, the part is always too far. I mean, it, just, it always disturbed me how far he would push that part. And I'm like, dude, this si the, the sideburn does not comb over to the other side. But OK. <laughs> um, anyway, those are just like little silly things. But definitely he's so identifiable. 
And mm-hmm. um, so anyway, he comes in and he he gets his his breakfast and he sits down. He's two or three round tables in a hotel r- breakfast room away from me. So he's he's pretty far. Um, and I'm like, you know, talking to my brother and a few of the other people were students. So we're getting to know each other and we're excited to be with other people because usually you're pretty isolated when you're at home. And um, I kept kind of looking over to just see like, you know, what's Phil Gothard doing? And he was just l- laser beam focused on me. Really? It was almost, it, it, he, just, he wasn't looking around the room and enjoying the fun of the other students. Like you would imagine that he would be because he's always so fascinated with the students. And he was just not looking anywhere else. And at first I was like, oh, that's really, why is he looking at me? <laughs> I've got something in my teeth. Like we're like really far away from each other. But then also it was like, does he see God in me? I mean, it's you're you're just like you're you're just hyping yourself up. Like I've been praying for so long that maybe this guy is just maybe he's able to see what I can't find for myself. Um, and he gets up and he starts to walk across the breakfast room and he beelines to me, and I'm like, oh, okay. And next thing I know, he's standing right next to me and he was like, "Well, what is your name?" And I was like, "Lindsay," and he was like. What a bright, shining countenance you have. There and it I'll is. Say, yep. Thank you, sir. And um, he was like, I would love to speak with you in my office after the seminar. And I was like, M- oh, sure. You know, I will acquiesce to your request, sir. Um, so off he goes. And uh, I didn't see him, you know, until later on that afternoon. We went like so it was in Atlanta. So he had a, a little satellite office. We went to his Atlanta office and um, he pulled me into his office for a minute. Just kind of like show me around. And he's like, well, I'll see you after the seminar tonight. And I was like, OK, so we do the seminar. My brother's he's elated. He's so excited for me. Like, this is so great for you. And I'm so happy for you. And this is amazing. He's a good little supportive brother. This is what always drives me crazy is some of the things that I will just never forget. You know, like it just, it, it's like it happened yesterday. I yeah. will never forget these type of details. So we were in another building with the kids and then we came over to an auditorium for the, uh, the basic seminar. And I had to walk through a full empty seminar, just the, the, just the whole floor of this auditorium all the way across by myself and um, his assistant and he uh, his assistant started walking towards me and then walked me to the back uh, side of the auditorium. And Bill was waiting there and was just so elated to see me, almost like he wasn't sure if I would have shown up or not. And he was just so excited that I was there and um, was like, oh, I can't wait for us to get to back to the office. And, you know, praise the Lord and da, da, all this like empty filler stuff. And we get into the van. And again, he's just so elated that I'm there and just like so, so grateful that the Lord brought us together and that I came across his path and how bright I am and how vivacious I am. And it was just like the praise just would not stop. Hmm. Um, And I'm like, well, thank you, sir. No, that you have to deflect praise. You know, he's giving it to you, but you can't keep it to yourself. You have to, well, the Lord and my parents and da-da-da-da-da. And I'm like, this is, is this good? Is this great? I have no idea, but, you know, just going to keep on with it. So I go back over to this area uh, or to his office and I'm immediately dumped in with all the other women that are like cooking dinner and all this kind of stuff. And I got a little agitated. I'm just like, what, what? (laughs) Like, I'm here for this guy. I don't want to be cooking dinner. I'm like, okay. Oh, I forgot. I'm a woman. Excuse me. So get all the dinner ready. And I, I go to sit down once we have the dinner prepared. And he comes in. He doesn't do this to anyone else. He walks over to my chair and pulls it out. And I was like, oh, okay. So I sit down and I'm not used to men. I know it sounds really ridiculous, but I'm not used to guys. I'm not used to dealing with whatever this is, right? So I just sit down and I'm like, this is really weird. I kind of need to get closer to the table. (laughs) And he bends down to my ear and he's like, you're supposed to bounce once. And I was like, okay, this is so awkward. This is so awkward. But I'm like, okay. So I go to bounce and he like shoves the chair in and I was like, whoa. So I get get shoved up against to the table and I was like, Okay, don't don't ever forget to bounce once uh, when when Bill's sitting you down to dinner, I guess. Um, It just those little weird, you know, moments and like he had to bend down and whisper it. You know, it it just it it was too intimate. And um, anyway, we eat dinner and then we go into the office and he's with his assistant who's over clacking in on his computer over in the corner. And uh, Bill just starts going through this list like, oh, what's your birth order? What's your uh, spiritual gift? And how long have you been in the Institute? And da, 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 da. How many siblings do you have? And blah, 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 birth order. Um, And then he's like, and uh, do you have any um, anyone courting you at this time back at home? I think I was 18 at the time. 
And I was like, well, there's, I'm not really courting this guy, but he's like 35 years old and he's been interested in me since I was 17, but my parents didn't think I was ready. So we're kind of getting in that space where he, we might be courting at some point. And he was like, oh, well, are you a virgin? And I was like, <laughs> whoa. That, that's the word that maybe I've never heard actually my father say out loud. My mother said it to me one time um, that my virginity was, you know, this special thing that I was supposed to hold for my husband. That uh, was the first question I asked your dad too, by the way. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. And then he was like, goats, bro, goats. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we must have a dowry. But is she a virgin? <laughs> Didn't and even bring like, me up to Bill Gother. Just not even close. <laughs> All right. Got it. He was cool. like, I'm sorry. Why are you asking me this, sir? You're zipping Ziploc bags at the children's institutes. <laughs> That's true. Nobody. <laughs> But yeah, so he he asks me this question and I I thought I was just like, do, it was almost like a business interview, you know, like I'm going for a job interview and I'm passing all the tests and I'm answering all the questions perfectly. And then like virgin, you dropped the V word. Um, and I felt so hot and uncomfortable and like I didn't know how to answer the question. And I'm like, you're not my dad. And also there's this random guy over here in the corner who's also hearing what you're saying. And now he knows my secret. That I'm a virgin, which really wasn't a bad thing in this culture, but I felt so odd. And I know now from having talked to so many other girls that he were his Gothard girls and stuff, that this was a common question he asked all mm -hmm. of us. Yeah. Um, and I really do believe for myself that he's testing the waters to see how you react to the question. Mm -hmm. And if you don't skip a beat or if you're very nervous about it, I think he just knows what type of person you are. And then he can figure out, like, how far can I push this? What what else can I do to test these waters? Um, <laughs> at the time, I obviously didn't know that. But I was like, wow, this is really like a really weird question. And so then I was like, yes, no, of course I am, sir, a virgin. And then he was like, well, we're going to have to release this young man. And I was like, well, he's kind of an old man at 35. <laughs> says me now at 45 going he was a child <laughs> <laughs> um but anyway i so that week bill was basically like well let's release this young man like you need to call him and release him and i'm like but i'm not even courting him like why do i why am i responsible for releasing this person this makes no sense to me and uh he <laughs> he kept pushing it every single night so the entire week, the same thing was just on repeat. I would finish the Children's Institute. I would go down to the front of the stadium and out we would go and travel over to his place. And then we would have the dinner and then we would have a conversation for an hour or so. Then we would go back to the hotel together in the van and whatnot. And then, you know, part ways and stuff. I have little entries in my journal, too, that have refreshed some of these things because I don't remember them as well. But um it, he definitely has these like really interesting conversations with me uh, throughout that week of, of, but always pushing for me to release this, this 35 year old dude hmm. um, towards midweek. He was like, so um, how would you like to come to headquarters? And I was like, well, that would be amazing. I mean, first of all, uh, sidebar, it would be really great to not have all these barriers to entry where I have to like work for six years at some training center. And then I have to have my life, faith and virtue journal and all this stuff, you know, put together and then memorize, you know, 80 books of the Bible, <laughs> you know, like have everything together. Uh, if you're going to fast track me, heck yes. And mm. my home life was not good. And so I was like, I would rather anything than that. So if you're going to give me the free fast track, uh, the answer is always going to be yes. Um, little did I know what I was going to walk into. Um, but I was like, well, Hey, if maybe I can become more spiritual and godly actually being around Bill Gothard versus the hypocrite hypocrisy that's happening at home and the abuse that was at home. And, uh, I went straight from the Atlanta seminar up to Indianapolis training center. And I went to the, uh, counseling seminar for two weeks because that makes you a full fledged counselor, by the way fully joking. Um, you know, now you can counsel everyone in the world as to how they can be a more spiritual Christian, especially for, as a fundamentalist. Um, I also went with three other girls. So there were three other, as I call of all of us, we are broken birds that he, he senses out. And um, the oldest one of us, 23 year old, she drove all four of us up to Indianapolis mm -hmm. to take this course. And then we all went from there to headquarters. Um, so that's my fast track. <laughs> so Lindsay, it, it really sounds like Gothard kind of qualified you during this week in Atlanta, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, and groomed you to, to an extent as well. Yeah, um, absolutely. Making sure that you kind of fit the mold of what he needed uh, to be one of his, his girls. What he was looking for. Right? Yeah. 
he loved that I also was not, um, he asked me about my relationship with my father, because of course that's very important to him as far as your authority structure. My father is not my birth father, he's a stepfather. And so Bill really latched onto that too. He was like, oh, well, I can be your spiritual father since you don't have an authority structure. And I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> like, I know he's my stepdad and I don't really like him very much, but I do have an authority structure. So you're kind of bonkers right now. Like you don't make literal sense to me. I'm kind of a literal person. And I was like this, this, I, but I have a guy, I have a dad. And he just found a way to insert himself. Always. Uh, I mean, that's, yes. that's what it is. Yep. Right. He, he found that, that inflection point for his manipulation mm -hmm. and just dug right in. And Absolutely. I vaguely remember your dad, but I have a strong memory that your mother was very intense. She was more, to me, like my mom was very effervescent. She was very uh, outgoing, extrovert, like really sociable. My dad is super militant. Mm. But I don't know. My Maybe my mom gave you a different vibe being that you were a guy. Do you know what I mean? Like it's hard to know, really. I, I don't profess to know anything about my parents at this point. <laughs> mm. I ran into, I ran into, mothers through my journey that was like reminded me of my mother who's a very yeah you know, the the whole like when you're talking about he asked you about your spiritual gifts and mm -hmm. birth order like that that's that's like astrological signs to everybody else yes. Like, yes. They, like oh this will tell us exactly what we need to know about you you know totally and, and you know my mother Should we go around prophet. the room <laughs> who's what's your birth order and your spiritual gift go Davey. I'm first born no clue what my spiritual gift is i think uh He's possibly teacher exhorter being funny, I, I don't exhorter. know if that's a spiritual gift or not. Oh, it could exhorter. be teacher okay. also, Lindsay. True, true. All yeah. right, what about you, Bryce? Second born. Spiritual gift? Mercy. Really? Oh, okay. Yes. I'm loving this. No, I'm a sucker. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I'll... <laughs> sucker. Where's the lost cause? I'm running into the fire. You little softy. Yeah. <laughs> I love a mercy man. That That is so true, too. Oh, yeah, because you, you want to be able to, to dominate them, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. Because yeah, I'm a firstborn prophet, but my father dubbed me a mercy. I was a fiery really? mercy. Well, a girl can't be a prophet. Hello? Right. I can't go. What am I going to go and preach? And, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm not supposed to say nothing. So you go through this counseling program uh, yeah. at the Indianapolis Training Center, which is incidentally where, where I went for my behavioral rehab stint mm -hmm. with Life Focus. And then from there, you go straight to the headquarters. headquarters. Yeah, I uh, I was so glad to get out of Indy. Holy crap, that place scared the living daylights out of me. It was weird, um, wasn't it? <laughs> it was overbearing. Yeah. It was scary. I had already gone to the Dallas Training Center for Excel when I was 15. So I that was my first introduction to training centers, and I loathed them. Um, I did not like the amount of oversight. I did not like... I just, the authoritarian structure and the demand, especially, I mean, I'm sure it was bad for the guys too, but on the girls, holy crap. I mean, they looked for any infraction. They looked yeah. for it. Mm -hmm. um, and when I was in Indy, I felt that. And I also was feeling something I didn't understand at the time, but I found out later it was the, the eyes of jealousy, envy, hate, and loathing as a Gothard girl. Mm. Yeah, I was the, untouchable. The the other... I was, yeah, yeah, like the whole center. Like they knew what we were there for. They knew that we were sent there because of Gothard, because we weren't paying to go to the counseling seminar. We weren't paying to have a room. We weren't, you know, um, they put me in the kitchen at one point to help out. And then all of a sudden I was like ejected from it. And I was like, what did I, <laughs> what did I do wrong? And just washing dishes. So I just, I started to feel this really strange, like I was just being treated differently. And I couldn't understand what that was about until much later. That's so interesting. And, and what, what year were you in Indianapolis, just out of curiosity? That was 96, October okay. of 96. So you were there a couple of years before I showed up. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> wreaked absolute <laughs> mayhem. Um, okay, so so after after Indianapolis, now you're, you're at the headquarters. Mm -hmm. and, and that's when things started getting really intense. Uh, oh yeah <laughs> in your relationship with gothard right it, it went yeah it went from zero to 60. uh he was not there i think the first week i got there he was out of town doing something else finding other broken birds i guess but um i i was there for about a week and i was starting to get warned by other girls to be careful hmm. no description just be careful and i'm like what 
I'm sorry, I'm very literal. What do you mean? <laughs> no one was giving me anything really to go on. And then, of course, Bill comes back into town. And the first thing he wants to do is have me come up and spend the evening. Um, and of course, I pack up my Bible and my notebook and my pencil. And I am just ready to serve. And I get up to his office, sit down. And I, I just, of course, at the time, I'm like, I can't believe I'm here. Like, my parents are never going to believe this. My brother is never going to believe this. Anyone I tell, they're like, here I am sitting in Bill Gothard's office, mm -hmm. um, hopefully going to help him with something amazing for God. Uh, I sat there for like two hours doing absolutely nothing. Nothing. Just And he's, he's just, you know, uh, dictating letters to like the mayors, city mayors and the, the, the fathers and just all this weird stuff and like the newsletter and blah, blah, blah. And then he switches into writing personal letters to other people, although he's not writing them, he's dictating to someone else. And uh, every now and then he gets a bit of narcolepsy and he'll just be like, and the Lord told me that you should, you know, really submit to him. And <laughs> and then he would just, he would just go down and I'm like, oh, 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 okay. You so just, just pass out right there in his oh, office yeah, in the middle of dictation? Just, yeah, he would just. And he would be down for like a minute or two, and then he'd come back and be like, "He pulled well, a Mitch McConnell. That's crazy." Da, da, da. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> totally. Or as and we call him now, just... Glitch McConnell. <laughs> oh no! Um, but he, yeah, he would just. But he, it was as if nothing had happened, and he just continues on with the letter. And oh. I was like, "Well, that is really freaking weird." But you know, okay, whatever. Maybe he's supplicating with the Lord. I was so innocent. I'm like, "Oh, God must be speaking to him right now." <laughs> How many Dr. But, Peppers he drank on the road to stay oh, awake gosh. in front of the crowd? Dr. Pepper ice cream sandwiches were one of his favorite things. I was I was asked to go and get him ice cream sandwiches from the freezer downstairs constantly. He has such a sweet tooth. Um, but that that first night, um, the assistant who was also in Atlanta, um, he went. To, he was wrapping up everything, put his, everything together in his little briefcase, you know, a little clickety click. And uh, he's like, well, I'm going to go now. And I could tell he was kind of he was waiting to leave the room. And um, I didn't know what I was supposed to do. Um, and Bill was like, well, have a good night, so and such. And he's like, all right. And do you need a ride back to your house, Lindsay? And I was like, um, and Bill's like, well, we're going to pray. And I was like, OK, I guess not. Right. You know, so off he goes. And uh I figured I would sit at the desk and he would sit at his side of the desk and we would just sit and pray. And he's like, well, come over to the couch, Lindsay, and uh, the prayer couch, as I so affectionately call it. Uh, we walked over there, red carpet, velvet couch. He loved Victorian furniture or like this weird 90s version of kind of Victorian. You know, if you've been to a training center, you freaking know what it looks like. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, red velvet and we kneeled down. And I, I figured like, okay, I guess he really likes to really get into his prayers. And so we kneel down and I'm holding my hands together and uh, ready to pray. And all of a sudden his hand creeps into my hand and he like wedges my hand away and he takes my hand into his and it's so fervent. And he's like rubbing his thumb all over my hand. And I'm like, uh, what? Like, Boys don't touch me. Men don't touch me. Like the only person that's ever touched me really as far as guys is my father. And it's always been negatively for discipline action. Um, there's, I don't have like loving touch at this point. And so I'm just like, I don't, I don't understand what this is, you know, yeah. and I can't pay attention to his prayer. I have no idea what the hell he's saying. Um, he could have been calling upon Satan for all I knew. I was not listening. Um, and then he starts j like starting to just like press the rest of his body, the profile of his body up against mine um, as we're praying, you know, elbows, arms, hip, thigh, knee, leg. And then I will never forget, like he started clacking his foot against my shoe, his shoe and my shoe. And I'm like, this is not healthy. Oh, this is so, could you just take off your shoe? Like I was so hypersensitized to what, mm. like, why are you clunkily moving your man shoe on my foot? Um, and again, I'm not paying attention to anything that's being said and I don't have the ability to speak out. I, right. I've never been in this situation before. I wasn't told at some point somebody may try to do something that is not good and you have the right to get up and leave. You can tell somebody, no, this is now, this is the most powerful man I know in right. my whole life. This is so, the prophet of God. Yes. And, and for 10 years I've been studying everything he has mm -hmm. ever said my parents idolize this man so i'm just like i'm in my head i'm fight or flight in my body i'm frozen like mm -hmm. just stay as still as you can and just endure this and then all of a sudden he nuzzles himself ugh, he like nuzzles himself into my head and neck and he whispers it's your turn 
And I was like, turn to what? Like, reciprocate? Like, I am not doing, I'm not leaning into you, bro. Um, and then I realized, like, oh, he means pray. He just, he wanted me to pray now. And I'm like, how do, how does my brain even function? I was on s- just such high alert and overstimulated. And I was like, oh, okay, deep breath. Just find a way to pray and use all of your imposter syndrome to make the most fiery prayer you've ever prayed and summon the fire of God down on this couch. And may he, may Gother just know that your, your soul and your spirit are on fire for God. So I, whatever I said, I said, and then, uh, as soon as I said, amen, I was like, and I'm out, like pulled my hand away, stood up, got to the door, was packing up my Bible and everything. And he, he's slowly, you know, getting up. And, um, I was like, well, have a wonderful evening, Mr. Gothard, you know, God bless you. And I just walked out. I didn't wait for him to say anything to me. I was just like Jack rabbit and I was gone. Um, that happened, uh, three to four times a week for at least the first six months that I was there. Wow. And he would find me. Uh, we had to go to lunches um, every day for, um, it was just a thing, you know, the lunch break and everybody would walk up to the second building, the staff center, they called it, um, and have lunch that the kitchen staff would put on for us. And Bill's office is right upstairs. So he would come down the stairs and he would just gazer beam around the room and look for Lindsay. And he'd, he'd lock eyes torpedo focus come over to me and be like well come up to my office this evening and i'm like "Uh." you know and i just i knew what it meant i was gonna go up there sit for two hours and then have this really uncomfortable prayer time and then i would i would just live for being able to eject myself out of that office and walk home um i didn't want him driving me home sometimes he would ask if i he could drive me home in his big blue bullet and i was like sometimes i would say yes because i also didn't want him you know, I, it was so it's horrible, but I didn't I didn't want him to think that I didn't like him. Mm-hmm. I didn't want there to be a reason for him to send me home because right. home, even though this was bad, home was far worse to me. Um, and so sometimes I would let him drive me home and I would sit in the front. And he had this like bin- bench seat across and he would ask me to slide over into the middle of the bench. Um, and I just I just would. You know, and nothing really, nothing more would really happen. It's like he was like feeling me up in the car or anything like that. But he wanted me close. Right. He never tried to like go into any, you know, actual like sexual parts of my body or anything um, for the whole time that I was involved with him or at the headquarters with him. But his amount of footsieing was obscene i mean i i just to this day i hate when people touch my feet i don't want any just do not touch my feet um because he would do it in front of so many in in so many different places in so many different uh, inappropriate times um he would always ask me to come and sit at the head table at the staff center when he would have delegations like taiwan and russia and new zealand and australia and you know you name it they were there russians romanians um and he would find a way to weasel his foot across. If I was even like two chairs down, I'm like, oh, yes, uh, he's not going to be able to get my feet. And then all of a sudden I would feel like this little like, do it, do it. And I'm like, what are you like? Are you like the inspector gadget? Like, are you dissecting your hip and like finding me with your foot? How are you doing this? Um, and I'm like, somebody has got to be seeing this, right? Or am I expertly hiding it? Because up top, with my face, you would never know. Bright, shining countenance, happy ATI girl, getting footsie under the table by Bill Gothard. In meetings with constantly with international delegations. Leaders. Yes, that's so crazy that he's taking this kind of risk. Oh yeah, constantly. And I'm like, I'm crazy. I'm really actually crazy. This is why do I keep doing this? And I'm like, well, I don't want to go home. I have I have only two options here. Endure yeah. it and be his favored or go home and just have no life for the rest of my life. Well, and, and right there, Lindsay, that's where this, this week of qualification comes into play, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Where he, he figured out where your weaknesses were, yep. uh, found out about your home life so that he could leverage that and manipulate you to, to pretty much do whatever he wanted you to do. Yeah, absolutely. Because he knew the fear probably I'm, I'm sure he knew the the fear that you had of going home of course and 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 right on cue my family was constantly mucking something up at home they were constantly mm. handing him the fuel to give more reason to pray for my family 
you know, this happened or that happened or my parents this or this and that and whatever. And I'm like, (laughs) then there were my health issues. I started having so many health issues at headquarters. And I understand now because of therapy that it was just from all of the trauma, the CPTSD, Mm -hmm. just from being home for 10 years. Now I'm enduring this and I'm completely betraying my own autonomy and integrity and my gut instinct. What is that? She's turned off. She's dead to the world. Gut instinct does not exist. Uh, gut instinct does not exist for me at this point, but I know that she's in there somewhere, but she doesn't know how to act upon what's right and wrong at this point against her. Um, he would tell me, be careful when you talk to other girls, they're not really going to understand the relationship that we have. Um, girls may become jealous of me because they spend other time with other, because he spends time with other girls. But, you know, I'm special. I'm seen as special because he brought me there. And I'm like, yeah, no, I already got that memo. Like, you know, the first week I was here, dude. Um, But it was just I found out later, actually, after the documentary, I had a few uh, girls that I knew at headquarters actually reach out to me and expand my my own story to me. (laughs) Really? That they act, yeah. One of the girls worked in the kitchen, and I it's funny because I remember people's faces from back then. Like, if you show me pictures of them now, I'm like, I don't know who you are. <laughs> but if you show me who you were back then, I'm like, oh, yeah, I totally remember you. And you worked in this department, you were in this house, and da da da. Anyway, she reached out and she did. She sent me, this is what I looked like back then. And here's a picture of us in Indy. And I was like, oh, what? Like, I forgot I even owned that shirt. Like, it was so bizarre that it was me. I'm like, it almost felt like that wasn't real. But she was like, yeah, I remember one of the times that you were in, uh, we were going down to Indy with Bill and he invited you to take your shoes off with him. And I was like, and all this time, I really thought no one knew that no one really saw it. In front of but other he would people, do that. he invited you to take your shoes off with in him. In the van. Yes, he had it. He had his own like customized van. It was this like maroon right. diggity do. Mm-hmm. Right. So there were he had bucket seats or captain's chairs um, in the back of the van. There were four of them. So they swiveled all the way around so you could have like a little office meeting. And so whenever we would get in the van, I would be one of the last ones and he would sit across from me um, and he I don't remember him doing this. I remember him playing footsie with me in the van, but I don't ever remember him inviting me to take off my shoes. So wait, and, uh, if you were across from him and there's other people and they're all facing, then literally yes. in the middle of all of these people, you guys are playing Twinkle Toes. He is. Yeah. Well, yeah. But other people are observing this. Other people are seeing him yeah. caress your feet with his feet. Ew. Yeah. Yes. Ew. And I was just like, I really didn't think anybody was watching that. <laughs> but I'm sure that, I mean, if if I was on the other side and I was in a van and he was doing this to someone else, I'd be like, wow, that's weird. But who are you going to tell? Like, who are yeah. you, you going to tell? Um, I would always try to, like, just shuffle my, like, adjust myself in the van and be like, oh, I just, my legs, I feel like I need to turn them to the side. You know, or like, oh, I think I need to go this way. But again, he would just, like, Inspector Gadget, and do do and he just find his way his long long legs for how short that man is (laughs) how strange that that was his obsession yeah um and and we know that he was doing this with with other women as well yeah Mm -hmm. um i mean certainly uh, it sounds like he spent i mean the the fact that you prayed with him three to four times a week for the yeah. first six months you were there. I, I mean, just to quantify that, that's probably about 90 to 100 times. Oh my God, I don't want to know. It's probably why I remember it so, so vividly. Yeah. But when I do tell the story of it, it's the first time. Yeah. And it felt like the first time every time. You know, I was never, I always thought I was prepared for it mentally. And then mm-hmm. it would happen and I'm like, I can't. Like even watching his hands in any videos, I can't. I mm-hmm. can't with his hands. They're like bloated water balloon hands and they come for you. Um, the answer is no. Um, but anyway, it was, he also had me go to Romania with him. Uh, again, just this terror of like, oh my gosh, like I don't, I don't, I just want to be as far away from him so that he won't even in, like tr- attempt to footsie me, especially because we were meeting with actual like officials in Romania. It was the first trip that they took there. Um, at one point he wanted to leave me there um to help run a character program in the women's prison prison uh, i was 18 years old 
Um, but I guess I had two weeks of, of uh, counseling. So, you know, I guess I knew everything about women's prisons. <laughs> you, you should have taken them up. Those those ladies probably could have taught you something. Those, what? <laughs> right? Listen, this is just how you make shiv. Okay, let me tell you. This man not safe for you. <laughs> yes, we take care of you. You not go back. Yeah, it, and even when when it all came down to me leaving headquarters and being sent down to Oklahoma City, which I know we'll get into as well, um, he wanted me to write a program for other young ladies so that they could avoid the pitfalls that I had fallen into. Oh uh, yes, the whole reason you got sent away. I titled yeah. it "How to Say No to Bill Gothard." Is that okay? <laughs> Does that float your boat, Bill? <laughs> he was constantly, just constant. And and I was in the ATI department um, for, like, that's where I ended up landing as far as what I did at headquarters. I, I actually counseled homeschooling mothers. So I probably talked to your fine mothers at some point if they really? were struggling with, yeah, with homeschooling or reporting or the wisdom booklets or keeping up with the curriculum. Um, yeah, all of us fielded calls in the information center and none of us were over the age of like 24. Newsflash, we never finished the entire set of wisdom booklets not once oh, oh probably, wow Bryce. we probably burned never. your files never <laughs> even started the life slash faith journal nonsense i i remember looking at that going like <laughs> i do not have the capacity to put myself through this because i i i would really like to go outside and, or play video games or something yeah. please for the love of god <laughs> it's simply busy work yep just want bill gothard to hear that your curriculum was simply busy work for children and it was not geared for children. Mm -hmm. The faith journal and virtue journal and the knowledge journal were jokes. Then you add the, was it the life journal? I think too. It was just a constant regurgitation of the same material too. It right. wasn't anything new that I didn't already know. Even the counseling seminar, I'm like, I already know this stuff. Like I've gone through 10 years of ATI Wait like, a minute. Did you get, did you not get the, uh, the, the, hang on, I'm going to censor myself for YouTube, the, uh, self pleasuring, uh, session because the guys did in Indianapolis. Are you closed, kidding me? They closed the doors. They cut off the speakers because the speakers is usually glass, right. whatever. Yeah. The, they turned that off and some dude who I'd never seen before came in and we had an hour session. <sighs> On self pleasure, what? On like how not to or how to? Oh no, why you shouldn't? Okay. Well, the rumor was that somebody got busted doing it, but there was a lot of weird, <laughs> wild rumors in Indianapolis, and that whole, you know, let's all line up and confess that I was, uh, I was oogling mm -hmm. a woman in in the elevator because I'd never seen one before. <laughs> you yeah, know, I don't know what to do with myself. I was trying to get out, but the door was closed. You know, um, so yeah, it was in a, it was a whole, I had, I somewhere I have like the single sheet of paper with the Bible verses and, and the whole Gross. thing. You know, I, I didn't go to a conference for that or a program for it, but I did have a, uh, a counseling session right before I got kicked out of life focus. Uh, and it was some guy and I had broken my foot while I was in life focus, like really badly. And Yikes. so I was in a cast and I just remember laying in bed in a hotel in it, like like in one of their little hotel rooms there yeah. for guests at, at the Indianapolis training center. And there was this pseudo counselor guy uh, that laid in the bed with me and told me all about how dangerous and damaging self pleasuring was. And Wait, shoes on or shoes off? Awkward thing. <laughs> Technically shoes off because one of my, one of my feet was broken, <laughs> but both, but him, the question is him. Don't recall. Were Do not recall. Involved? I'm probably I'm probably blocking <laughs> this out, out a lot, y'all. Yeah. He lay hold on. He laid in bed next to you? Yes. I I remember how uncomfortable I felt. What there's in there's the scripture world? about that. When a man there's lays not with a man, yeah. Direct scripture about footsie, it, but I think there's scripture about that. Yeah. I, I it doesn't make any sense. It does not make any sense. So uh, much of this doesn't. It was the most bizarre experience because I went to several counseling sh sessions uh, okay. because I was in so much trouble at, <laughs> at the Indianapolis Training Center. And there yeah. was that 
that one that I'd specific, I don't remember much of the conversation except for him telling me some really weird stories about family stuff uh, mm -hmm. that shouldn't have been happening. Mm -hmm. um, examples of other young men who had gone astray with their sisters, which was ugh, just so <sighs> bad. Why are you telling me this? You don't, yeah, you don't need I, this. I'm 16 That's not years counseling. old. What are, what are you doing? Um, so I remember dumping. that very vividly. <laughs> and then I remember sitting in an office uh, with a, a very elderly black man uh, who was also mm -hmm. a counselor and, and one of Gothard's close friends. And the whole time he was doing this counseling session, he would frequently cover his face with his hand and then pick his nose under his hand. And it was, it was just like, dude, do you think we don't know what's happening right now? Uh, but both of my parents were in that counseling session as well. And so I'm just sitting there wow. like, this guy is going to town. And your, and your parents are like, Nothing to see here, kid. Just Nothing ignoring to see it. Here. Yeah. He's a so man can of God. Grab one of those. It's holy. talking about Bible verses. Yeah, it was Davey, so strange. Knowing you as well as I do, once you were busted, and regardless of them putting you through all of this, how over it and done were you? Like, you were just like, oh, dude, go. I was so done. You were 16 at the time? I was 16 at the time. Okay. Yeah. And, and I, I got busted for fraternization, uh, mm -hmm. even though they didn't have proof that I had fraternized. Uh, and I had some other infractions as well, like an ex. She an ex blushed every to... time you walked by. Every time you walked, <laughs> yeah. she turned beet red and bit her lower lip. And and Mr. Uncle Bill knew exactly what that was about. Yeah, it was. He'd I, never I was, seen it directly. Wait, wouldn't at him. that be I was Uncle stealing Burgundy? Recruits. That's what it was. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. So I, I mean, it, that's ultimately why I got sent to the prayer room. And and mm. quite honestly, once I got out of the prayer room, that's when in my mind I was just like, I I don't care anymore. Out. I'm, yeah. I'm going to do whatever I feel like doing now. And then I broke my foot after that. Um, and so that was just further confirmation. Well, actually, when I broke my foot, I was like, is this God? Is this a punishment from God of when course. I broke my foot? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because that's what we're taught to look for. It's like instinctual. Yeah. We look going, mm -hmm. oh, this is when God exists, when the bad yep. stuff happens. Were your yeah. toes exposed from the cast? Oh, yeah, of course. Okay, I Lindsay, I asked that because I no. guarantee you if he could have gotten his hands on black fingernail polish, he would have immediately painted his toes. Oh, that I wasn't, I wasn't painting nails. I wasn't I wasn't that emo yet. Not not yet. <laughs> Problem is you would have had to talk to girls to get the nail polish and you would have gotten in trouble again. So. <laughs> True. Yeah. yeah. You know. Well, I, I stayed in trouble. Or Sharpie that. marker. You could have Sharpie markered it. Could have done that. Yeah. That would all, been kind, all kinds of potential solutions. Uh, <laughs> just some grease from the kitchen. Um, <laughs> A lot of it to be had there. So, Lindsay, how long were you at headquarters total? Just shy of three years. Wow. Yeah. And was there a point at which Gothard started leaving you alone? A little bit, yeah. Okay. Um, like, the prayers still happened. Um, he still was very invested in me. Um, I just started getting a lot more savvy as to how to avoid his attention. Mm. Um, not going to lunches skipping meetings saying i was busy with you know ati enrollment was so overwhelming or this project i gotta finish it bill da, da, da. um it was always mr gothard i would never call him bill now i call him bill for as out of uh, major disrespect but um he uh i was warned by gary fraley at the time he was my my immediate authority um as far as like departments at headquarters I was cautioned by him at one point to maybe not tell Mr. Gothard everything that's going on at home because mm. Pastor Fraley was also very aware of what was happening at home. And um, he was like, I just think it would be wise for you to not share as much with Bill. And I don't think you should be spending as much time with him. And I kind of, of course, you know, you're supposed to just, you know, acquiesce to them. I, I keep using that word tonight. Um, you're yeah. supposed to just like, you know, just say, okay, yes, sir. Absolutely. You know, you just tow the line, but I was starting to get really frustrated. I'm like, he's Bill Gothard. Right. How can I say no when he asks? Like, do you understand what you're asking of me? Like, if you don't want me to be with him, then you should talk to him. Exactly. And of course, no one's dealing with it. The board isn't dealing with mm -hmm. Bill. He's doing this with many other girls. Mm -hmm. And I got to the point where when he wasn't with me, I was just so glad it wasn't me. And if I had to be up at the staff center and I was going to walk by his office, I would not look in his office. I did not want to know who the next broken bird was. 
And I have felt a lot of guilt for that over the last 20 plus years that I could have been somebody that could have, you know, blown the whistle or said something or made a stink enough and not cared about whatever happened to me, but just like fought it somehow, even though I have nothing to fight it with. Um, But with a very amazing therapist, she was like, you were in survival mode. Right. This was you surviving your circumstances because you knew the lesser of the two evils was to try to remain at headquarters as long as you could. And what could you have really done? You would have been shut down and sent home in seconds had had I tried to really do anything. And I never told anybody at headquarters either. I told two different people. One of them is now my husband. And even he didn't understand how frequent the prayers were because I was too scared to tell anybody that it happened as much as it did. Because we all know, you guys, they would have looked at me and said, I was the harlot. I was exactly. the one that was, you know, uh, seducing him. And, you know, mm-hmm. how dare I get that close to Bill Gothard? And I was the temptress. And I'm just like, you've got to be kidding me. I could not trust women. I could not trust men. I trusted no one but my own self. But but here's the thing that's so frustrating about that, Lindsay, is because this Pastor Fraley guy, mm-hmm. he knew what was going on. Yeah, they he all knew. did. The, the leadership knew what was happening and did absolutely nothing. And then when it finally came out, denied ever knowing anything. Yep. That's yep. what is so infuriating to me because here's a guy that's basically telling you, hey, maybe don't share everything with him because he's going to use it to manip- manipulate you. Mm-hmm. Try not to spend as much time with him because I know what's going on behind those closed doors. <laughs> right. But God forbid I actually do anything about it to stop this from happening. Yeah. Because yeah. Gothard, he was the cash cow. Mm-hmm. And that's what it all boils down to. Well, and I think they were all afraid. Let's be real. Yeah. They were all afraid of him. They would get fired. They would lose exactly. their jobs. Mm-hmm. They want job. They have job security, if you know what I mean. Like they, mm-hmm. if you tow the line, holy crap, you are there for life. There are people still there. Yes. From when I was there 20 plus years ago, I can list them off on my hands. Like the this, 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 this person, this person. They are still there. Mm-hmm. Even with the documentary, even with everything that happened with the lawsuit, they are still pushing IBLP. Yes. It infuriates me. They need to be completely demolished. Like this organization needs to end. And I really think that because it's constantly a focus on Bill Gothard, they think that they have continued, they're, they're under the radar. Like, right. oh, it's not Tim and Lewandowski. Oh, it's not, you know, Robert Barth. Oh, it isn't Larry Guthrie. Oh, it isn't Otto Koning. Oh, it's not any of these people. Yes, it is. It is those yep. people because without them, IBLP fails to exist. And they were all complicit. And all they of still them were are. Complicit. Mm-hmm. They still are because none of these materials that they are using now in the home discipleship ministries or Home Discipleship Network is what they're calling it now. Mm -hmm. And down at the very bottom of the website, it says, a ministry of IBLP. Um, So it's, they are, they are so, I think, relieved that everyone's focusing on Bill with shiny, happy people. Mm -hmm. Everyone's focusing on the Duggars with shiny, happy people. But hello, universe, IBLP is still existing with Bill's materials. They are not putting out new stuff. They are regurgitating everything that Bill Gothard ever taught. They've just wiped his name from it. And that's something that Bryce and I have discussed over and over and over again, is that Bill Gothard was not the problem. He was a problem, he but was he's not problem. the problem. Yeah. Uh, the problem is the ideology that mm-hmm. they are still teaching. It's, it's completely parallel to what's happening in the Christian church as well. This is a s- systemic problem that is happening across America very specifically America, I think. Of course, it happens in other, you know, Catholicism and stuff as well. But everyone is turning a blind eye to the victimization and to the abuse that is happening in the name of God that is happening right in front of their faces. And Christians, I know that this is hard to hear, but you are cowards if you are not strong enough to listen to survivors. Mm-hmm. Nobody, I did. I do not want to be known as a Gothard girl who was footsied for three years. Who in the world makes that up? I would like to have just gone about my life, not had years and years of therapy, 
be completely estranged from my parents because they can't take ownership for even putting me in that situation in the first place. I would, no one asks for this. Mm. The only thing we ask for is that non-Christians and Christians alike, more so the Christians, that they stand up, open up their ears and listen and stop taking this as a personal attack on their religious beliefs. Right. If your beliefs are so strong, you need to start reading your Bible again and quit listening to what others are saying and blocking out what you don't want to know. Mm -hmm. That is not how you get through this life. That is not how you show God's love. I am an atheist, but I will tell you, I know how Christians are supposed to be. And I know what they have not been for decades. And I am just hoping at some point that the right Christians will start to rise up and fight for their beliefs and stop this horribleness. These are the Pharisees. I want, I want a Jesus to walk in and flip the tables. We are allowed to be angry for the abuses that we have suffered. And we are so angry and we are trying to get the message out and it is falling on deaf ears. I don't know how to make this change, but to continue shouting it from the rooftops. I, I could not have said that any better. I, I mean, that, that's exactly what people need to be hearing mm -hmm. uh, because it's exactly what's happening. Yeah. Uh, and, and you're right. There is this blind eye that is turned to the abuse. And it's, yeah. it's so infuriating. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't think I, I don't think I can add <laughs> to what you said because you said it so well. <laughs> One of the one of the main things that I've really thought about a lot that is like come to set in my brain, it was like, OK, the thing is that in these organizations, you don't actually have to take responsibility for anything because either you were out of favor with God and the devil made you do it or you could be in favor with God and God told you to do it. And so you don't actually have to own anything. You could literally kill somebody and be like, oh, the devil made me do it. Or, hey, God told me I should kill that person. Mm -hmm. But if you take that away and now it's on you after years and years and years of all of that, because I'm not involved in any organized religion. And when I separated and, and got out on my own and was going through all this, like, and I had to own everything. And I'm mm -hmm. like, Wow. If, when you can just be like, oh, I'm just going to pray about it. Oh, God, what am I doing wrong? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Whew. Now I can get yeah. through another day. When well, that's gone, your guilt. Mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I need therapy. Somebody help me. I, <laughs> I have to deal with this now. It gets too, it gets too muddy, really. When, when, when you fight that for so long, you, the waters are so muddy, you're never going to see it clearly. You have to go to another pond of water. You have to leave it. And I don't mean, I'm not telling everyone you, you can't be a Christian. What I'm saying is you need to remove yourself from the experiences and the environment that you're in and give yourself distance from it and then come back in it and you will see it with different eyes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You just, you have, there's no possibility that you wouldn't be able to see it differently. Now you may say, oh, wow, I really do believe this. And you're going to be more committed. More than likely, you're going to be pretty stunned at what's happening. Like, get in touch with your empathy, people. Your empathy. The fact that I talk on TikTok so much about my experiences and people are like, well, you just weren't a good, you weren't an actual Christian. <laughs> oh, no, <laughs> I wasn't. I'm sorry, but again, you haven't read your Bible. And you still are not listening to what I'm actually saying. You right. are more interested in defense mm -hmm. of yourself. And I'm not into denial and defense take ownership over the fact that you actually don't give a crap about what happened to me because that's actually what you are really feeling. You don't care because it wasn't you and because it wasn't you, you're grateful. And I must have done something to have made that all of that happen to me. I am still somehow at fault. And that is the guilt that gets piled on by people like Bill Gothard. Mm -hmm. That is, you know, just this, you cannot get out from the guilt and the shame because that's what he wants you to feel. God doesn't want you to feel that. You know, when you look at the Christian faith, that's not what God is after. It's he wants us to be free and love and embrace people and uh, be comfort and compassion to them. I truly believe that. I am, again, I'm not a Christian, 
But I do, I can see where the Bible was trying to go with things. And I'm just, I have a really hard time seeing that in this, in the landscape of American Christianity at this point. Oh yeah. And, and I mean, we, we see it constantly um, just to reinforce what you're saying there, Lindsay, in, in some of the YouTube comments uh, of prior episodes that, mm-hmm. that we've done where the excuse is always, oh, well, Bill Gothard just wasn't a real Christian. That's not what, what right. Jesus would want you to do. That's not what the Bible teaches. Well, mm-hmm. the problem is in their view, yes, it was. And, and that's the whole problem is that you've got people like Gothard, um, like a lot of the fundamental evangelical community that will go in there, interpret it how they want it, and then preach it to you as the absolute truth. Yep. Um, and it happens over and over and over again. And if it's not happening in the evangelical community, it might be happening in another religion, like, like yeah. Mormonism. For Absolutely. In- for yeah, so well, many. The, the fastest growing religion in Africa right now is Mormonism. Uh, wow. And it's more of the same fundamental religious ideologies. I've had so many conversations with Mormons after Shiny mm-hmm. Happy People. Um, I, I'm just shocked by it. I've been on several mm-hmm. podcasts as well, um, like Mormon podcasts, and I just never realized how close we were in oh, our ideologies. It's crazy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's amazing also that that a documentary like that shed so much light and caused so many in their community to start questioning. Yeah. And I was like, yes, 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 this is what I want. I don't want people losing whatever they're, if they feel like they need their religion and they need that. I, that's, again, that's not what I'm after. I'm not, you know, a horrible human. I just want them to think for themselves. Think for a minute, aside from what everyone is shoveling at you. They would prefer if you just signed up and did exactly what they say, though. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And I did that for over 20 years. So I un, I, I yeah. uninvited myself. <laughs> 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 okay so after three years at headquarters um you then got moved away uh mm-hmm. and i know that there was a specific reason for why that happened and why you fell out of favor ultimately with bill gothard can you can you tell me about that i kissed a boy and i liked it <laughs> nice love that Tainted for you love. Yeah. <laughs> um i initiated it too um which to me is even more fun but wow. um <laughs> Yeah. Um, he he's an amazing human. No, he didn't. <laughs> um, but he actually he actually cared about me before I cared about him, which I think is really cute, too. Um, it took me a while to come around to it because, again, I just I was like, man, ew. like, I don't I just really no Thanks. You know, my parents had a bad relationship. I'm dealing with Bill. I don't get bleh. like I just don't want to get married. <laughs> Your first boyfriend you know? was like in his 60s. It felt weird. <laughs> <laughs> I had a 35 year old when I was 17. Yeah. Um, you know, I just had to have had the best luck in relationships at this point just too young um, <laughs> too young too old just right um but he he was just an amazing human being um all throughout my journals as a kid as a teenager you know when they slapped the purity ring on on us at like 12 13 years old you know you're instantly you instantly realize oh the rest of my life is about finding the right man and then having kids and procreating and so i or raising them up and so I just thought, well, you know, all I want, and I've said, I said it time and time again in my journals, I just want someone to be kind. Mm. I just want someone to be nice um, because my dad was not. And I just felt like the whole world was full of these like really mean, demanding dudes. And I would see guys at church. And of course I would get, you know, a little infatuation here and there like, oh, he's kind of cute and stuff. But then I would, I would see one thing. You know, whether he was like, you know, had had just an attitude one day at church or something. And I'm like, oh, no, no, he's not kind. Like, he's not he's not going to be kind. I was very hyper aware of that stuff. Um, and with my guy, I just he was always he's very he's a little quiet, but always a kind person. He was always there if I needed something. Um, but I was like friend level, you know, I'm like, we're staying at the friendship level. And then um, it just it very slowly progressed. And I at this point in time, when I met him at headquarters, I was actually living in Brook Manor which is a building right across from the staff center and Bill's office, like our windows, you could see each other. 
And um, at one point, I had finagled my way into getting a phone line into my bedroom specifically because it was a pretty big manor. Um, and there were like, you know, party lines, you know, they would have like three bedrooms would have one phone line. And I was like, I think I need one in my own room. And I made up some reason why I would need it. And then that became the way in which I could, you know, like do dial up so that I could have my computer um, and work from home on Citrix. <laughs> and then I would also like start calling my man because <laughs> he had his mm. own phone. And so we would have late night conversations. Um, and I was like, he's just really amazing. He's so fun and he's so kind. Again, he's just really freaking kind and he's adorable. But um, I, I never really thought like, oh, this could be the one. Because I think at this point I was 20, 20, 21 years old. And I was just like, again, I, I think I'm going to be 35-ish when I go to looking to get married. You know, I don't, it's just not for me. Um, and he, through a series of events, I was just like, I can't, I can't with this. Like he has big pillowy lips and I kind of need to have a moment with that. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. <laughs> so I was like, I have the to do lust, some Lindsay. Filing. Oh my God. The <laughs> lust. I was like, I have to do some filing on a weekend up in the attic area of the production center. Um, can you come and help me? <laughs> and, you know, yeah. So there we are. We had our. How our many things did you drop on the floor and pick up before he <laughs> understood what was going on? Or did you just attack him? Yeah, pretty much. No. <laughs> Honestly, I don't remember exactly how it happened. I just remember it was like, I'm not leaving this room until I kiss this guy. Um, because I wanted, we just had a relationship, you know, and I just, I knew him. And so I was like, I knew that at least I could kiss him. And even if it didn't work out, he wouldn't tell anybody, you know, mm -hmm. that it could stay a secret between us. Um, so yeah, it was super wonderful. And as soon as I did that, I was like, oh, now I understand why my parents didn't want me to do this kind of stuff. <laughs> I mean, great. I have I have no concept, <laughs> truly, as an ATI girl, I have no concept of what intercourse is, none right. whatsoever. Mm -hmm. But I'm just like feeling the things for like, you know, <laughs> going, whoa, what's happening with my whole body right now? Um, but anyway, we, we kind of, you know, we have this moment and then I was like, we cannot do this here. I was aware of two guys that had already been son ho sent home because of me at headquarters. And so I was just like, I... I can't with you can't go home because of me like I won't be I won't stand for it and uh so we go our separate ways I go back home and it's like I don't know one in the morning or something and we we end up calling each other as we do every night and um we're not like lovey-dovey like oh I love you so much or oh this is so wonderful and yeah, you're my boyfriend it wasn't like that it was just the day or what was happening and the stressors and shit and uh, anyway, we both said, like, that was great. And I was like, yeah, thanks for the kiss. It was amazing, by the way. However, w literally, I'm going to reiterate this. We cannot do this again. And he was like, yeah, I know, I know. And I was like, I'm dead serious. Like, I know I want to do it again, but we can't promise. Swear to me, you will not let me come anywhere near you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't control myself around your Don't pillowy lips. Don't be near me. Don't look at me with <laughs> oh, your pillowy lips. Trust me, it was, it was the same for him. He's just like... <sighs> no minor pencil lips, bro. <laughs> he was not getting the pillow lips out of me. But anyway, so I was like, we're just, we're not doing this. And he's like, no, I know. So anyway, we say good night. And I don't know, like 15 minutes later, he calls me back and he, his voice was so different. It, he was just like, Lindsay. Um, and I was like, what's going on? What's wrong? And I was like, wide awake, sat up in my bed. And he was like, so um, this individual uh, came to my door just now and said that he heard our conversation and um, we have 24 hours to tell Bill or he will. <laughs> 